What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Against All Odds podcast. I'm here again with my fiance, Mimi Duggar, but she's not going to be on camera. It's all on me today, just on the on the money maker. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're just trying a different style. We're trying so. a different style. So we're doing yeah. a, a QA. and a So I just posted, like, ask me questions on my Become Elite Instagram. You guys submitted questions, and Mimi has all the questions already kind of read through. She has picked out some of her favorites, and she's just going to ask them to me. I've never read or seen these questions. I haven't even, I haven't even scrolled through them. So um, all these questions are going to be brand new to me. And the goal of this podcast is to really kind of fire through, uh, like, 20, 25 questions for this, uh, for this whole thing. So um, without further ado, let's roll the intro and let's get started. I know a lot of you guys were real bummed out last uh, last podcast that we didn't have a sponsor. Um, it's kind of funny. Everybody was like, where's the sponsor? I, know, like, I thought do they you, would be happy. Yeah, do, you guys, do you guys want the sponsor? <laughs> we should do more sponsors. I guess, yeah, we should just do more sponsors. Yeah. But we do have a sponsor coming. Um, there, it's all ready. We just, just got to do our research. We just have to research it and get the ad read all right. I've already tried out the product. Mimi has yet to try out the product yet, um, but I'm excited about it. So don't worry. There will be a sponsor in the next episode if I remember to do the ad read. Um, but other than that, yeah, let's just get started. Mimi, do you want to start asking some questions? I'm so nervous. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I'm on the spot. Okay. <laughs> to start off, I'm going to try to say the names of the people who asked them, but a lot of these, like, I can't really understand. Yeah. Amari just say. Okay. Says <laughs> <laughs> at this stage of your career, would you still go down a level to maybe go back up again? That's a good question. Um, and to preface, you just did that in yeah. New Zealand in case people did. Yeah. So to preface it, I was in the USL and then in 2018, I had to drop down to the, to the New Zealand, um, central league play down there for a season to come back up to the USL. Uh, yeah, I think I would, because I feel like right now, like right now, this is the prime of my career. And let's say I couldn't like, because of the coronavirus or whatever, I couldn't get a contract for next season. I would want, I wouldn't want to end at the prime, you know, where I feel like the best. So I would for sure give it like another season where I drop down and do all that. Um, before I, before I really kind of give it quits. But if I was up in like 30, 31, then yeah, I would probably be like, you know what? I'm kind of, I swear, <laughs> is so fidgety with her microphone. Get it set. It's is good, it it's good, good? It's, it's good, good, it's good. All right, um, so no, to answer the question right now, yeah, next season for sure. I drop down again, I drop down again to Iceland 10th division um, just to play to bounce back up. Okay, good answer. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Oh, this is about, is DA Development Academy? Yeah. So a lot of people are asking about the Development Academy. Apparently it's shutting down, mm -hmm. whatever that is. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, everybody, everybody's always been asking me about like my opinion on the DA shutting down. I mean, it's always unfortunate when uh, some, like a league like that or something has to close down or shut down. Um, just like with any league, when NASL folded, it was unfortunate. When, you know, any anything else folds, it's usually not good, but there's always going to be something to replace it, whether that's ECNL, whether that's a new academy system or academy league setup. Um, so don't worry. Something will replace it. There's going to be, there, it's just all the players that were playing DA are just going to go to the next league or the next level, whatever that is, and that's going to become the highest level of play. So you guys don't really have to worry about it. Everything will be okay. Um, and yes, it's unfortunate, but everything will get settled and, and figured out. So um, that's my opinion on that. All right. So this next one is by Metin Seventeen Akildes. Okay, stop reading the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to choose a, a, a couple questions that are specific um, situations for specific people. Mm -hmm. And this person says that with all the work they're putting in um, going into their senior year, they have zero offers. Should they be more realistic with their goals and quit? Um. So is this like high school into college? I'm, I'm assuming it's high school. Okay, so, so they're going no into their senior year. They're working really hard, but they have zero offers. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to treat this like a high schooler going into college. Um, it's it's tough because like I don't want to give the answer of like yeah, always never quit, never quit. Because I do think like you have to be realistic with not only your goals but what you want out of life. And I think it could there is such a thing of people kind of wasting their life if if this is not what they want to do it or it's not realistic at all, and they've kind of missed their chance to throw away other very good opportunities that they have set up just to chase something that has a less than 1% chance. So I don't want to give that answer of like, never quit, you know, always go after your goals because it's just not realistic. Um, 
I would say that going into my senior year of college, I or senior year of high school, I had no offers as well. I didn't have any collegiate offers. And if you guys listen to the the college podcast about how I got recruited to play, you'll hear that I got my first interest in a college the summer going into my senior year. So I wouldn't panic right now and think like, oh, I need to quit. I need to decide now. But at the same time, I would kind of get into push myself into high gear of like, look, if this is important to me, uh, you know, you only have kind of one year left, maybe even less six to nine months in the six to nine months. If it were me, I would put it into high gear, emailing coaches, uh, creating great CVs and highlight videos, sending this out, attending ID camps, do all that possible. Give it one last go. And if by the end of all of that, and I really gave it a hundred percent effort and I still had no offers, even from schools that like would be at the bottom of kind of like my, my safe schools, then yeah, maybe I would be realistic with myself and kind of be like, it's I, obviously I, I gave it everything I could. And even on my safe schools, I am still not getting offers. Maybe then I'd be like, it's time to quit time to focus on something else. Um, but yeah, I think that you shouldn't panic yet. And if this is important to you, or if you even have a dream of playing college soccer, it's not unrealistic to have a great senior year and to procure like a lot of interest during that time. All right. Good answer. Thanks, Mimi. I kind of zoned out for that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is from What's a Circle. Are you going to grow out the stash? <laughs> I kind of had the stash for a little bit. Mimi liked it. Did you show it in the video? I had it. I think I had it for like one podcast or one video or something. Eh, no it was cute <laughs> please no i don't know so the answer is maybe no all right this one i'm actually interested in the answer uh-oh biggest regret in your career so far the biggest regret and in i my... think i know your answer what do you think let me hear what you think my answer is my guess is that you regret leaving orange county blues to go to st louis no really uh-uh okay i'm wrong no, I don't regret that at all. Uh, I would say my biggest regret in everything would probably be my like kind of like youth career like summed up is that I overthought it like a little bit. I feel like like from age of. But does youth count as your career? Because it says career. Career. I mean, you, you're not. a. That's not your career. That's well, let me give being, two answers. OK, so one regret that I had was in my youth, like from 13 to 18. Like I just played a ton and I trained a ton. But a lot of me was kind of like where I see a lot of questions that I get now of like, how do you improve this? How do you improve this? And overanalyzing how you improve something versus just like, look, I'm going to spend 10,000 hours, 10,000 tries of kicking a long ball, 10,000 times to do this. And I wish I would have focused all that effort on technical training and versus um, and playing and rondos and small sided and just developing that that pure playing instinct um, versus doing some of the uh, like fitness, like a, a lot of my youth coaches and stuff did a, way too much fitness at the time where we should have been focused on technical training. Um, and I even think for myself, like just, just play dribble tech, do some drills, but don't worry about it. Just touches on the ball and spend time playing with the ball and playing in small groups. Um, now, uh, for my career, like my professional career, I'm trying to think if I have a regret. Um, I don't know if there's like a big regret that stands out to me. Choose something. I, oh, actually, you know what I would say is a regret in my professional career is, um, is not, there's times where I didn't like, I didn't create a whole body approach to my, to my workouts. And I kind of just got into this tunnel vision of if I'm strong on the squat, if I'm strong on the, you know, the major compound movements, then I'm strong everywhere. And so I neglected areas like the lower abdominal uh, do, abdominals, like the groins, that like the hip flexors, because I just focused so much on strength, power, big compound exercises, and I didn't do the tiny little movements um, like the banded hip flexor knee raise, where you're just targeting <clears throat> the hip flexor or doing Copenhagen's to target the groin. So I think that's a big regret in my career is that I wish I had a more well-rounded, balanced um, weightlifting training program instead of just focusing on power, strength. An explosion during that time. All right. This one's from Junas Kolska. Okay. Heard you don't do longer runs in one of your videos. Why don't you train this kind of stamina? Because so longer runs are great. I think like, especially in a quarantine, like I went, I've been on a couple longer runs lately. Like I went with Toby and Brian. We did like a four mile run. Um, Mimi and I have done some walks slash runs. The, the mile number changes every time you tell me the story. <laughs> 
What did I say with Toby and Brian? When you came in the first time, you said five miles. And then that later that day, you said six miles. No, it's four. <laughs> it's somewhere around there. Um, but no, that was like something that I just said a regret from my career when I was younger is that like I had a, some youth coaches that we did instead of training on like a Thursday, we had a full just let's go on a, a trail run and then we'll do some track sprints. Like that was our training session. On We, we trained twice a week. And so you didn't went, even touch the ball. Yeah. So we just ran. And like to me, it's like fitness is great. And it's, it's so important uh, as you go higher and higher up to be fit. However... I think that there, you shouldn't be focused so much on being fit that it takes away from your the, the main part of soccer, which is playing with the ball and touching and technical. And I think that like there's definitely some teams or coaches that I think can focus too much on fitness like that. And I think longer runs is like almost the worst style of fitness because you're kind of just going out on a longer run. And I think it's still good. It's better than nothing. And if I don't want to take anybody like take that away from anybody, you're still going to improve your fitness from doing that. But I think to make the most game realistic style of fitness training is to do hit training you know, high intensity intervals where you're going out doing changes of directions, changes of sprints, uh, sprinting for a little bit, incorporating ball work into that, cutting, turning, doing stuff like that. And, or at the very least going on a treadmill and doing something like the John Terry cardio workout where it's very 20 seconds on 40 seconds of rest recovery periods. Because in a game, it, the 90 minutes you might run, yes, eight to 10 miles in a game, but the eight to 10 miles, like I think they, they cut down and showed the average length of your run. And I think it was the, the majority of your, your runs are between like five and 10 yards. So you should in court to be the most game realistic. You should be doing hit style training, recovery periods, and doing some sort of in, incorporating like cutting, turning, change of direction. And when you can incorporate the ball work. So I'm not saying never go on a run if you'd like to do that. And, and like I do that every once in a while, but I think there's just so much better ways to do that. Even right now to do fitness, I'm doing like the Ronaldinho drill, high intensity sets, doing something like the beep test, doing something where it's like we're going on a walk and I'm doing like a hundred yard sprint and then I'm walking back and doing another sprint. So that's how I like to cater my fitness training. So it's the most game realistic approach possible. Good answer. Thanks. All right. This one's from underscore Ronan three. Ronan three. Would you rather never play football again or never see Mimi again? Uh, never see Mimi again, for sure. <laughs> uh, no, there's days where I'd probably choose that answer. But, but uh, no, I think that the most important thing, like I think that everyone says like, oh, f you know, football is the most important thing in your life. But no, it's I it, am. It's very important to have balance in your life. And I think the most like I've I've gone through periods where I've sacrificed being with Mimi, being with my family, being with friends, sacrificed a lot just to play football. And it's it's tough. Like it's it's definitely like you kind of see that it's very important to my life, but it's not the most important part of my life. Oh, yeah. But don't get used to it. Mimi. I wish we had the things where you can make like noises like on radio the shows. Boards. Yeah. I need a soundboard. <laughs> oh. oh, OK. We had a couple people wondering. Mm hmm. How long did your nutrition certificate take? <laughs> <laughs> um, so they say four to six weeks. And I want to basically say that I have a very good background uh, of nutrition. And I've studied this since, I'm not kidding you, I've probably studied this and done research every single week of my life since I was 13 till now, which I am 27. So 14 years straight of studying, researching, trying to find out how to best tailor my diet and nutrition plan to become the best athlete I can. So I'm not kidding you. When I read through that, I could go and take a chapter quiz or take a practice quiz and I could get 60, 70% with, without even looking at the course material. So it was very, very expedited. Now I, like I, it was, it honestly was like, it was fast and I don't want, I, I'm honestly, I'm struggling to say how long it took because it was so fast that yeah, I, don't I don't think want, you need to say exactly how long. I don't want to discredit it. Like it, it was, but even though you did, like you would pass the chapter test, like you would still go back and read every single thing through it for your own knowledge. Yeah. But my, my worry is if I'm like saying that it's going to, people will be like, Oh, that's such an easy program. But like, it takes people four to six weeks to do it. So well, every test is different for every person. Yeah. So it was very quick though. It was quick. How, oh, this is Cal Riley 87. Mm -hmm. When and how did you move from a striker to a right back? Uh, from college to pro. So I was playing striker. Actually, the funny thing was I played all the positions, every single position on the field besides goalkeeper growing up. 
So I didn't even know what position I was going into um, college. I kind of just played a, as a winger and attacker, center mid, whatever. When I went to these ID camps, I just kind of played wherever there was an opening, um, which I think actually was pretty smart because I got the most time on the field. So people were like, does anybody play winger? Did anybody play right back? I was like, I do. Keeper? <laughs> yeah. So I had so much field time and I was actually being recruited as a fullback. The UC Davis, when they first start, started watching me, they thought he'd be a good fullback at the college level. I came into college and they immediately was like, we are lacking on strikers. Matt played some striker. He was actually a striker in some of the ID camps that we watched. Let's put him up top. I went up top and since I was so versatile, I did well there. And I and that's where the team was lacking on positions because of injuries and some disputes with the coaches. So immediately I got my chance um, to play. I... I seized my opportunity. I was striker and attacking player for my whole collegiate career, but I wasn't like the whole life being an attacker. I was like everywhere. But those four years, that was where I was like, I'm an attacking position, winger, striker. And then as soon as I left college, my, not only my college coach, but a, a professional scout for the MLS, um, an agent. And I think another coach somewhere else had all told me, um, look, we really think that you would be best suited to play that fullback position. So we suggest kind of like moving back towards that. So I was like, you know what? I'll be right mid. I'll kind of move back there. But um, after doing some trials and talking to some professional coaches, a lot of people even there at that level were like, yeah, I think you should be a fullback. So I kind of just took the advice of everybody, moved back to that position. And since then, since 22, 23, I, uh, I've been playing fullback. Well, I thought it was interesting how they asked that question because I feel like most people ask you why, but they're interested in how, like, was, was that transition like hard? No, 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 no. I like, I don't know. Like for me, I've always been the type of, pro I mean, I've always been like that though. Like I could be, a, I've played center back for some of my club teams. And then the next game I played winger and then I played center mid. Uh, I've always been able to like play everywhere in the field and, and pick up. Like I, like I really think like I could go and switch and play six, you know, as I get later into my career, I think I could play winger as I have played winger at the professional level. So I it wasn't like back. a big, a big, no, it wasn't that deal. big. And I think most for the majority of the pros out there, I think they can switch to a position and pick it up pretty fast because it's just a game and it's all kind of like the same things. And you should kind of know as a fullback, even if you've never played before, I shouldn't let this guy cut inside. I should keep him outside away from the goal. That's like a concept. Everybody Kind of, I, most pros have a gut instinct to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just learning it real quick. So I don't think it's that hard, especially if you're watching and studying and, and just kind of like being a student of the game. Mm -hmm. Oliver Eilis 17 says, what is your body fat percentage and what is normal for pros? I think the normal pro is like 10, 10% body fat. I think that's a very average range. Maybe I, you have pros like Cristiano Ronaldo and some people who are down to like 7% and you have some that are upwards, honestly, to like 20%. Um, so I think for me, I probably around eight, 9% body fat, I'd say right now. I have people tell me that like I'm lower, but I honestly, I've seen people, I've seen people who have got like the full DEXA scan. I haven't ever got the DEXA scan, um, but I've seen people do it and I've like compared myself a little bit. And I think eight to nine is like a very realistic body fat percentage for me. Um, I, I feel like I, I have been at points where I've been like 7% um, and it was great. It's, it's just hard to maintain once you get lower and lower. Uh, but I think that I think everybody, every pro should shoot for around 10%. And if they can, everybody's body's different and find out what you can maintain the best and the healthiest at. But I think 10% is a very realistic goal for pro footballers to try to get to. And even though there are pros that are higher, I think it's always good to try to just become the best that you can with that and fitness, everything. All right. This one's from Lewis underscore Cox and like X. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, you what? just looked at me weird. <laughs> Um, I thought this was a good question and I don't know if you've answered it before. You might've, but it says if you could have the ability of any soccer player and add it to your game, who would it be? And I guess what ability? I mean, it'd just be like Messi's dribbling, you know, probably, or it's yeah. Messi's dribbling. Yeah. It's, that's pretty much, yeah, that's probably, pretty much what I would do. Messi's dribbling. I think that's just the most unreal thing. It's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because I think that's like, I think I wouldn't take, for example, like Ronaldo's physique because like, even though like he's amazing, I think adding that to my game wouldn't have the best impact. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I think that you could consider it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think the best impact would be like Messi's touch and dribbling. Okay. This one is a good question and you've probably made a video on it, but Wan boy asks is speed genetic? Yes. So in, to an extent, so there, that's why Shelly's so fast. So there are people, there are people a hundred percent speed. There is a genetic factor to speed. Uh, for example, Gareth Bale, there's like stories that he was running like a 10.5 second, uh, hundred meter dash, hundred yard dash, hundred meter dash, hundred meter dash. Um, <laughs> in like middle school when he was like 13, 14 10? years old. Yeah. Like in the tens. Wow. And I mean, there's just people out there that will not do any specific crazy speed training and are just very genetically gifted with speed and quick quickness. Um, and there's people out there that have the body type or whatever that they are just genetically slower. So there is a genetic component to speed. Having said that every single person in the world following a speed program that works on everything from raw strength to speed strength of like moving weight fast to raw velocity training and like, and where you have like parachutes on the back of yourself, hill sprints and doing stuff like a very tailored program to improving your speed. Every single person out there can increase their speed. And especially even if you have a lower genetic ability with speed, you'll see even better and better benefits from that because you'll really be engaging and developing fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, and that's a huge belief of mine. Now, like example for me, genetically, I have always been um, uh, always been faster. I've always been a faster player, um, especially after puberty. Uh, but I've done a ton and ton, a ton of training, speed training to try to develop even faster and to become more quick. And so I think like I have seen after weeks and weeks, like eight week speed program where I've like really developed and trained that way of my, my sprint speed really, really improve. And I've seen my hundred meter dash time improve and improve and improve. So yes, it, there is a genetic component, but everybody can get very, very fast. What are you laughing at? <laughs> when you were talking about how you've like done tons of training your whole life to improve your speed or whatever, I just instantly thought of that one video you sent me of that one Christmas when you got, <laughs> when you got like the parachute thing and you like immediately went outside and it was like dark outside and you were just sprinting up your street with the parachute. And yeah. I was like, this kid's like five years old, <laughs> but that yeah. was like a couple years ago. Yeah, it was like, when I was like 22, 20, That was really 21. funny. Do we no, have that? Do we still have that video? I don't know if I have that video. I think oh, it was on my mom's phone I don't or know something. why it just made me laugh so much. Yeah. But, but yeah, everybody, I mean, and I'm not, and I still think like nobody like like for example, if you could train your entire life, but you may never break 10 seconds in the hundred yard dash, hundred meter dash. Um, but you will get, you know, you will see it significant improvements in that. I feel that. All right. Underscore Matthew France says, is it a big difference in standard between San Jose U 23s and the USL? Um, yeah, yeah, there, I wouldn't say it's hard. Every time, like, I feel like no matter what, this is something that I've experienced a lot. Every time that I've gone from, um, let's say, a B team, a B club team up to an A team or an A team to, to an academy team or an academy team to a D1 college, collegiate soccer program or D1 to the San Jose Earthquakes U23s or that to the USL or the USL to the MLS, like all those levels. And I haven't played, I gotta say that I have never played in the MLS, but I've played with MLS players and higher level players. But every time I see the difference of that level of the players in those levels, it's minute, minute differences across the board from their speed. I mean, everyone's always like, what attributes do I need? It's everything. Like you just see, they play a little bit faster. They're able to do things in one or two less touches. They're able to control that ball 90% of the time versus somebody at the lower level might only be able to control that ball 80% of the time. Maybe they are a little bit more fit. Maybe they are a little bit faster. Maybe they are a little bit more athletic. Maybe they do have a little bit more experience in game knowledge when they come to those situations. So like every single thing is just little tiny differences, but they do add up and you can definitely see a noticeable change. So to answer the question, there was, a difference you there was definitely a noticeable difference between the u23 level um at the usl league two or the pdl level with the earthquakes u23s to the usl level but again like you could take some of those players from that level and put them in that usl level and they wouldn't stand out of being like a like terribly bad but you could probably definitely see uh just small differences of like Oh, you know, maybe his touch isn't as good as the rest of the USL guys. So it's small differences, but there is a difference. And I think like to show that, I mean, I trained with the USL 
or I trained with the San Jose Earthquakes and I was there and most of those guys ended up or had been had played a year at the USL level. Um, but yeah, it's it's just small differences all the time that you push up. So just focus on that. Okay, I thought this question was good for today. Uh-huh. Um, C. Domato Jr. says, what do you think about caffeine consumption for teens and athletes? So, um, this is a really good question. Can you give so, a background, a backstory to this? Yeah, so, to, <laughs> to, so I actually did some research on this today. And speaking of that nutrition research that I've been doing constantly, I literally today for like 20 minutes was researching caffeine consumption and the the need to cycle on and off for athletes. But that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but basically, Just watch the next vlog. Long story short, I have, I wanted to try to cycle off caffeine because I've, I am a big caffeine drinker. I, I have a, two cups of coffee a day, probably big cups of coffee. Uh, and I'm, and because I've done so much research to see the the effects, the positive effects and the low side effects of having caffeine um, before cardiovascular training, before sports, before all that stuff. It has so much positive effects um, that I think it's such a it's a, a performance enhancer. It's a legal performance enhancer. So I'm a big proponent of using that for sports. However, when it comes to teens under the age of 18, you're still developing. And when in caffeine, when it comes to your brain and all that stuff, it really can um, have a negative effect on the developing and growing brain and body. So it's always talk to your doctor about that. My recommendation um, is if you're under the age of 18, do not consume caffeine, especially in large quantities. It's not going to be good for you. You're still developing. Um, just wait. And you can do pre-workout without the caffeine or like lower levels of caffeine, right? Cause that's like, I, I would do that. Just the stimulant part. You mean the beta alanine? Yeah. Yeah. Like I bet some people like want to take something when they go to the gym or whatever. Yeah. But even that, like I think if for teenagers, young. like just forget it. Like, I mean, the effect that you're going to see from that is very minute. And especially at the younger age, I think my recommendation is, is to not do it. And, and that's what all the science says to with, with teenagers and, and the developing brain and body with caffeine. It's not smart. Talk to your doctor if you really, really need it for some medical reason, but talk to your doctor about it or a registered dietitian. Um, but like I didn't start taking caffeine, anything, any caffeine at all, besides a little bit of caffeine, maybe in soda, like once a month, but I didn't start taking any caffeine till I was 19, 20 years old. I think 21, maybe even. Do you not have pre-workout till you're 21? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cause I, I just knew it was bad for me. So I was like, wow. nope, not even going to touch it. <laughs> and then, uh, once I got to college and started doing very rigorous days and long days of school and studying, I was like, and then I was like, okay, I need to do a workout and I was dead. I was like, okay, I, I need something. And I did that for a little extra boost. And then it's a, a vicious endless cycle of needing it. Um, but it is definitely like it is a performance enhancer. It helps you with it. There's scientific studies and meta analysis that have looked into that and showed that compared with the placebo caffeine does improve your endurance. It improves your cardiovascular endurance It improves your perceived rate of exertion. It has so many positive effects. And you proved um, that. Huh? And you proved, I proved that, that because today. I tried, I did cycle off. And after reading it, like if you're using it for sports performance, you really don't need to cycle off um, because the effects don't diminish over time. But um, uh, I didn't take caffeine and my beat test score, I think I got like a 13 2 today. And then I went and trained and it was a terrible training session. So you should have seen his park jobs too. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even park. I couldn't even park the car. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my answer with that. You don't need it at teenage years, and it's not. It can, it can even be dangerous, but um, I do recommend it later on in life. All right, Matt Weller eighteen says, "When are you getting verified on Instagram?" <laughs> that's the question of the, the my entire life. No idea. The USL. If you're a USL player, you're supposed to be verified, but uh, for some reason, I I can't I can't get it. Do you know I tried doing that for you for a present. It was like Christmas or anniversary or something. Cause I have friends that work like for Instagram and Facebook and stuff. So mm -hmm. I was like, is there anybody in the verification department that I can talk to? And I was going to try to get it for you, but no, they, it's wouldn't, an ongoing, they wouldn't help. <laughs> it's an ongoing joke with my team. Actually, like everybody in my team is like, there's people who are on there who are verified with like 2000 followers. And I think I have like 35,000 now in my personal one. And they're just like, Oh, you're never going to get verified, Matt. Like, blah, blah, blah. Like always make fun of me. But the day it happens, I'm going to throw a big party 
for the verification blue blue check party. I know. I, I, wasn't that my idea the other day? It was like, <laughs> we need to have a blue check party and have all the foods blue themed, blue cookies, and oh, everybody yeah, has to wear marks. blue. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though. Oh, everybody should wear Nike because it's a little check. I think it... Eh. Just wait. It'll be fun. <laughs> maybe. Just maybe. wait. We'll talk about that one. All right. Jasper Vernoyj one yeah. says, what is important? What is more important, technique or physique? Technique. Thousand percent. I mean... I knew that one. I it's like you can have, be... Obviously, look in the top leagues in the world. There's players out there with not very good physiques. David that, Beckham. That play... He's even he has a decent one, but there's players with much worse physiques than him that play at very high levels. But you will never see somebody with a great physique that has terrible technique. And I know people are gonna be like, oh, there's like this guy, but his technique is still very good. He might be bad compared to the rest of the Premier League players, but his technique is still good. So work on your technique and work on your physique. I think work on everything. But if you, what's more important, technique, physique. Basic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kyle Cook one says, "What's your proudest ever moment?" My proudest ever moment. I would say, I mean, I think my biggest accomplishment would be signing the pro contract, the first one, like my first big one in uh, in Orange County. What about not career related? Mimi's pointing to her wedding or her engagement ring. Um, not that. No. <laughs> no, I mean. What was the question? I'm just kidding. What was the question? What is your proudest ever moment? Proudest ever moment? Yeah, uh, probably. Honestly, I think it was very, very big to sign that national letter of intent in college. I think that weight meant more to me almost than my pro contract. That's crazy to me. Yeah. I never knew how big of a deal D1 was until like you told me all the stories about you. Like it definitely is more rare to sign a pro contract. It's harder. But I think because of where I came from, like... And how in that short span of time over two years of being from B team, like struggling yeah. to even make my A team and having parents and everybody like make fun of me for like, he thinks he's going D1 and stuff like that. Did you say your parents? No, or other, other parents, oh, not like, my what parents. What is wrong with them? No, 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 no. Other parents. Like my mom was, my mom was sitting in the stands one time um, and she, I was like guest playing with the A team and someone was like, who's this, who's this right winger right here and the mom was like oh that's matt he's on the b team but he thinks he's gonna go d1 and they like laughed my mom was sitting right behind him so screw you guys <laughs> <laughs> screw you, Gabby. no but no it was a very like i think i'm even more proud of that one given where i came from because with the pro contract i really had it, that resume uh, to back it up with the earthquakes u23 is a good to, to, uh, d1 um, background training with Sacramento Republic. So it was hard, but I think I, I was just more proud and more emotional signing the D one contract. Yeah. I think what it was too, I feel like I was like desensitized to it almost cause so many people from my school went D one or just went like straight pro mm -hmm. that like, I didn't know like how actually hard it was. I was like, Oh, there's another one, you know? <laughs> yeah. But now when I hear stories, I'm like, wow, like that actually is my, uh, my senior year. There's only two of us that went D one. No three, but one of the Gavin Hoffman signed late. There was probably like 30, 40. <laughs> yeah. Like there was a lot and there was a lot too that signed. Like I said, really early, like sophomore year, they're like walking around with the keychains. I'm like, mm -hmm. what the hell? Like <laughs> we're sophomores. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. Rafael Espino. Wait, Rafa. Is that Rafa? Yeah, it's Rafa. <laughs> he says, "What is your weakest and strongest attribute?" My weakest and strongest attribute. Um, and I'm guessing it's like question, soccer Rafa. related, or do you think it's like in general? Well, I'm just gonna do it. Yeah, I'm gonna do it soccer do related. Do both. Do both. Um, I'd say my strongest attribute would be uh, like I'd probably say work ethic, like work rate, something about that. Like I think. In terms of like, if you look at the teams I've been on, maybe she made a funny face. No, but in, ter in terms of the, the teams I've been on, like I've never been like the most skilled, the most talented, the most whatever. But I think I've always been the person who does the most or around the most, one of the hardest working in terms of the gym work, in terms of the injury prevention, in terms of uh, the extra training, in terms of staying after and doing extra stuff. Um, I think I'm always one of the guys like who likes to stick around and do extra. So I think that that component is definitely that like desire to like just do the most I can is probably my best attribute. And I think that's what's helped me the most in my career. Um, I think my weakest attribute, I would probably say, and I think this is what I've improved the most too over the last three or four years, but I would probably say my ability to play um, comfortably 
in small tight spaces out of the back quickly or just anywhere on the field in very tight spaces. I think that's always been a big weakness of mine um, because I've never grew up. Like I said, in this podcast, there's this theme of this podcast of my regret going back. I wish I could go back and train or, or coach my teams when I was younger and have them focus on playing rondos, do tons of rondos, tons of possession drills, tight space, play, move, pay, play, move, you know, all this like a uh, very Latin American style of play Tiki-taka. versus Tiki Taka. There you go, Mimi. Look like at you. Barcelona. But I honestly wish I would have done that because that, that carried on through my life. So I think that that's definitely my weakest attribute. But having said that, I went from 22 years old of that being like I was constantly in the middle of rondos and 5v2s or whatever and struggling with that to now I feel like it's definitely not one of my best attributes but I think I've really improved that up to the to the point of I can I can hold my own now and now my goal with these last few years is to turn that into like no now it's I'm one of the better guys on the team playing in these small tight spaces which is hard because you have very very talented guys now um at the pro level with that tiki taka style of play. But no, it's definitely, I think that's my goal. And I think that has been my weakest attribute that I've worked on the most. Okay. Thanks Rafa. And I, is that weird that I picked his question and didn't even realize yeah. it, but okay. Can you answer it now? Like not soccer related, not soccer related. Yeah. Um, how about you answer that? Your best and worst attributes. Actually, no, don't answer Or about that. myself. <laughs> I can answer it. Um, I, uh, not soccer related. I would say my best. I think it's the same thing, honestly. That my, I think Playing my be- out of the back. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're funny? <laughs> yeah, no, not soccer related playing on the back. Probably oh because No, I think my strongest I'm attribute crying. is very similar uh, to that of, of just work ethic. I think of it and everything of... Uh, you know, like I think with everything, with YouTube, with with building physique, with with my whole life, it's just been just work harder. Like you know, if I haven't been born blessed with uh, with genetics to be muscular, or I haven't you know starting my YouTube channel or starting Instagram. Are you saying your best attributes is to get muscular? No, it's my work rate and effort to change that about myself. But that's still soccer related. No, my work rate, just in general, like working and staying up and working to build. That's be- true. I think, I think that like, it's, I think the, I get obsessed about something and I work so hard to try to like improve whatever that I get my mind around. So I think that's like my best attribute. Worst attribute could probably kind of be the same thing. I have very tunnel vision when it comes to stuff. I was going to say listening. Listening's bad. <laughs> you suck at listening. Um, but I think it kind of all centers around. I'm so like, I get very tunnel visioned that yeah. I, nothing else outside of that matters. It's really to me. hard to get you to like focus on other things or like care about other things. Yeah, like or- if I'm like, look, my goal right now is to b- finish this YouTube video for tomorrow. It, the house could become a wreck. Uh, the house could be on fire. House, house could be on fire. Gucci could not be fed. Mimi could be yelling at me. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, I need to get this video out. I need to get this video out. So I think I, I, I think that's my worst attribute of like at the same time. Look, yeah. you, need, you need to be able to balance it out. Like I, I'm very bad at balancing out and not just focus, focus, focus on this. And it, it can hurt me in some ways. Only you would have your weakness also be your strength like Dwight Schrute yeah (laughs) my weakness is also my strength yes exactly (laughs) all right this one I thought was really good because you actually relate to it yeah Arda Dogen I probably said that wrong six says why do I not sweat a lot when I do some exercises whereas other people sweat a lot yeah (laughs) that's a good question I actually looked into that because I am I am the least sweatiest least sweaty least sweaty least sweaty person I've I think I've one I've ever met I just don't sweat on the same way. It's all genetic. So the amount you sweat is genetic. Um, you can be in the same environment doing the same exact thing um, and be the same level of fitness as somebody else. But the level that you sweat is all genetic. Uh, and I'm one of those people that just don't sweat at all. Like I, I in Tulsa, it could be 115 degrees outside, 100% humidity. We're getting a crazy training session out in there. And there's guys after the warm up that are just look like they jumped in a swimming pool, like Toby or Brian. And then you have me and I, and they mu- wear like multiple shirts, like different, don't they have to like change their shirts? Uh, that's for games, but oh, not yeah. trainings. But like, um, and I, after the warm up, will have like maybe a little ring and some like, like a ring of sweat and, uh, it's like sweating on my head, but I just don't sweat and it's just genetic. And, um, I mean the people who sweat more, they can dissipate heat. Like it it helps them a little bit better, but then if you don't sweat, then you retain water better. So it's like you probably are less prone to cramps and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, you can't control it. You can't change it. So 
just know that about your body. And if you're a person who sweats a lot, you're going to have to drink a lot of water and eat a lot of salty foods to replenish that. And if you're a person who doesn't, then you need to find ways to kind of cool yourself down, spraying water on yourself or doing whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know if you already said this because I kind of zoned out again, but, um, just because you're not sweating doesn't mean like you're not burning the same amount of calories. Yeah. Like a lot of people, I feel like that's probably what they're worried about is that like, Oh, these other people are working harder than me and mm-hmm. it's not no, really it's the not case. That. Right. No, you can be burning tons of calories and doing hard, even working harder than somebody else, but they're just genetically a sweater and they're going to be sweaty, sweatier than you. And it's tough because sometimes I get in that mode where if I'm sweating and I'm really sweating, then I feel like I, I have a good workout in and it's hard to not think that. Um, but yeah, no, I've done full great workouts. Haven't even sweated a bit, have nothing. I could feel like I could just don't even need a shower, but it's not like that. And same thing. It works in the reverse too. Just because you're sweating doesn't mean that you're getting a good workout in either because I see people that put on extra layers to try to sweat, lose fat or whatever. It doesn't work. It's just, you're just losing water. Adeline, I don't know how to say that one, says, do you watch anything other than The Office? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I put on The Office so much because I like it in the background just for some background noises. People put on music while I'm working, while I'm napping, while doing whatever, even what, like messing around on my phone. Yeah. We just um, always have it on. And then, cause I'm like, usually throughout the day, Mimi and I are just working on stuff on our computers doing like I'm doing become elite stuff. Mimi's is doing her interior design stuff. And then usually after dinner or, or during dinner from like eight o'clock, seven o'clock till the time we go to bed is usually when we actually watch like a, a normal TV show, a movie or something like that. So no, the office is, we have it on because it's familiar and we can zone it out and focus on other things. Okay. There's only, I think this is my last one. Okay. Um, I thought this was funny. Harvey Davies 09 says, do you care a lot about social media, like growing your brand and everything? (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) Of course. No, of course. I think it's very big. He obsesses over it. Yeah. And I think it's hard because like there's two sides to it. I think that you shouldn't have like like a mental health problem with it and, and associate, associate who you are or your value based off your followers or your likes or stuff like that. I'm obsessed with it because I, I think it's growing a brand is huge. In, well, yeah, in it's like your day. business. It's your business. It's literally what, you know, makes money. And, and for me, especially, and, um, I think it's important to focus on that if you want to do something like that with a business, grow a following, grow an audience, and then market something to the following. Um, But I also think that like, it's not important to me in the fact of like, I don't really care. Like it's like likes, like, I don't know you, especially once you start to grow a following, you realize how little it really means. Um, like for me, it's like getting 6,000 likes on a post. is kind of like, I don't know. It's hard to explain. You know what I'm saying? Mimi? Like, it's like, it's just numbers, you know, it's just numbers on a, on a screen. Yeah, it's just, you obsess over numbers. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why you obsess over social media. Cause you see it all as numbers. Yeah. But it's hard because it's like, once you kind of, I look at it, I think it's a huge that I'm getting those numbers because it really means like my videos and my stories like impacting. Those. Yeah. I don't think it's for like a, like a vanity thing, you know, like it's not Yeah. because like it makes you feel more valued. It's because like you want to spread knowledge yeah. in your brand. Yeah, but and I definitely obsess over it, but like, I don't know. I, I've even kind of like played with the idea of once I'm done and just like retired with, not with soccer because I want to keep doing Become Elite stuff, but once I'm done uh, with just working in general, like as I'm older, just to not even really have social media or like to limit it because I'm not, like I'm big on like some stuff, but I don't know. Some parts of it, it's just kind of like very van, like vain and I don't know. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Is this um, talking about TikTok too, or is this just like... No, I'll keep TikTok. I love TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so just to end it, uh, this one person asks like a really good question, I think, to wrap it all up because mm-hmm. it just seems sentimental. Saikao Sy- Jata <laughs> says, how would you like to be remembered? How would I like to be remembered? I think I did. I answered this. In I some. think we talked about it like when the whole Kobe thing happened. Yeah. But I just think... It would be good to say again. Um, I would lo- I would love to be remembered. Uh, I think the most important thing is just being like a nice person. You know, I think that's the most important thing. Honestly, like if, if you just be someone's like, no, he was really nice, you know, uh, 
and I have to work on that. (laughs) (laughs) Not to you, just to everybody else. (laughs) Uh, No, I think to be just nice. So people are like, yeah, no, he was after a game. Talk to me or like I talked to him or I met him here. He was a, he's a great guy. I think that's very important. I think also uh, just hardworking. Like I, that's something I really want to be remembered for is like very hardworking person. So anybody, any teammate that talks about me in like 10, 15 years or like anybody that I've come across, it's like, no, he's awesome. Nice guy. And the guy, he just grinds, like he just works. And I think that would be a very cool thing to be remembered as. Uh, and I also think it would be awesome. Uh, it's like what I said, just about the numbers, like to impact a lot of people. I would love it if I could impact a lot of people and that's what makes my day the best emails or the best messages I receive and I can't respond to them all, which is amazing. <laughs> I've never thought that I'd get there, but just how I've impacted a player's career or their life or changed their perspective on something or help them uh, gain motivation or, or view their injury or view their career or view their setback or whatever in a different light, which I think is pretty unreal that I'm at the point where I've impacted people's lives. So I think those like three or four things is like what I definitely want to be remembered the most as because I think it's, it's what you're going for. It's like, it's like, uh, like Gary V says, like you're working for the people, the numbers at your funeral. Like you want to have a life that you have the most people at your funeral that are the most, it's like Kobe Bryant. Like how many people were affected by that guy's life? Yeah, that was insane. Yeah. That was probably like the biggest, like I think, community like countrywide mourning that I've ever yeah. experienced. And if I could just have a sliver of that, just a half a percent of what he did, well, that would be that would make you know make I don't my whole to life. Die, tra- die tragically young, but yeah, no. But I mean, I'm talking about yeah. what he impacted because like even for me, that was the hardest I've ever took any celebrity's death ever in my life. Like I was, I, I was visually like like affected by it visibly visibly visually <laughs> I was, I visually i just picture you like can't see anything <laughs> no i was visibly affected by it It yeah. really did hit me for like a day or two where i was i was like damn like that i was like wow and I know. So, what's crazy about his death was like everybody was talking about him as a person not really him as a player it wasn't like oh my god the yeah. best basketball player ever just died it was like he was such a good guy and he impacted like the reason why he impacted my life is because like i saw how hardworking he was and the mindset he had and it inspired me. And it really like, I, I feel like even though he's just an unreal like person and, and worker, I felt like I could relate to it in a little bit. And that like, it just motivated me to just go after everything and to be a competitor and try try to be the best athlete I could become. And he was a great guy. So it was just like a perfect like combo. And like, he just really, I was just like, wow, that's like somebody I would, like a role model he's just a role model so i think that would be like if i could just have a sliver of that when i die whenever that is hopefully a long time from now but um that would make my whole life honestly any other questions no but i just got sad because i don't want you to die (laughs) (laughs) i'll try not to okay yeah that's my last question they were all good it was hard to choose but Mm -hmm. yeah so how how long were we doing that for i don't know how long does the camera record for like 30 minutes. Okay. So this says about 19. So add that to 30 50 minutes. Mm-hmm. Cool. Good. All right. Good podcast. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys liked this one. This was just Q and a Instagram Q and a, um, other than that, catch you guys. There's nothing new. There's catch nothing you on new. The with flippity flop. Catch you on the flippity flop. There's nothing new with my life. It's just mm-hmm. training, working out, doing fitness stuff when I can. And I'm just, just waiting for the, news on when we can train with the team again so it's been kind of boring but i hope these podcasts are helping you guys get through something i uh catch you guys in the next one if you guys like this one hit the thumbs up button subscribe if you guys are not subscribed you guys are listening to it follow do whatever and um we'll see you guys next week thanks for watching peace peace